Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the uh, MFC Auditorium for this next presentation. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Matthew Garrett. Uh, Matthew is, uh, claims to be very, very opinionated, and he specialises in power management at Red Hat. I'm not really quite sure which part of the management he is powering, but ladies and gentlemen, um, <coughs> introduce Matthew Garrett. Hello, uh, it's loud enough? Great. So, I am Matthew Garris. This is, with luck, not a surprise to you. As mentioned, I work for Red Hat. Um, I am not speaking on behalf of Red Hat. I am a member of the Fedora Engineering Steering Committee, and uh, I'm not representing them either. I spend most of my time working on ACPI and power management, uh, and while I have laptops here, a great deal of that is actually in the field of servers. I'm not talking about that. I have in the past been a fruit fly biologist, and I'm sure, as you can guess, uh, I'm really not going to be talking about that. That would probably actually be quite upsetting. So. I am, in fact, going to be talking about the Linux community and how it's a wonderful thing and also how it's an astonishingly hate-filled place that we should get rid of entirely. Well, that's not entirely true. So, the main problem that I had when I came to actually start writing this presentation as opposed to just writing the synopsis that I put in for the call for papers was trying to work out what the phrase, the Linux community, actually means. So uh, I checked the Oxford English Dictionary, and it told me that a community is a body of people or things viewed collectively. I didn't really find this particularly helpful. So of the people here, I just want to ask a few questions. First of all, how many of you use Linux? Okay, that's not a particularly surprising result. How many of you would, oh, how many of you are at a Linux conference for the first time? Okay. How many of you would regard yourself as a member of the Linux community? Okay, so most of you, and there are some people who aren't. Uh, who, who don't feel that way at present. So um, my girlfriend is a Linux user, uh, so I thought that I should ask her what the Linux community was. And after a short argument where she spent a while insisting that she could in no way be considered a member of the Linux community, we finally got to, it's like the careers. <laughs> and this actually makes some sort of sense. Uh, when we're talking about the Linux community, we have many bodies that are different, that are their own populations, but overall they have a great deal in common. And the rational way of viewing them is as a single thing. So we have, for instance, here a picture of the Colonel Summit attendees in Tokyo last year. And it's obviously very easy to say that the people who write the Linux kernel are clearly, by some definition, the Linux community. They're the people who write the core code. And we look at these people and we see a body of very technical people. Uh, these people write code and occasionally they sleep. There may be some other things, but they're by and large uninteresting in comparison. At the same time, it's also obviously the case that saying this is the Linux community is not a terribly useful or interesting concept. So here we have the participants at an Ubuntu Developer Summit. And so in this case, we're not just looking at hardcore technical developers. We're looking at the developers for a wide range of pieces of software 
we're looking at the people who put that software together in a form that then allows other people to use it. But we're also looking at the people who write the documentation, the people who help users out, the people who do the testing, and then the people who run the services that make all of that possible. So again, we can say that this is perhaps an embodiment of the Linux community. It's the people who make Linux. So that's another definition. But when we're here at this conference, how many of you are users or would describe as users as opposed to developers or documenters or anything? Right. LCA contains not just the people who make Linux, but it contains the people who consume Linux. And to say that these people are not members of the Linux community is, I think, again, it's, uh, sorry, excessively limiting. When we look at the participants here, it's impossible to say that the people who are here and using Linux are not members of our community. So really, when we're talking about the Linux community, we have to say that the Linux community is everyone here and also many millions of other people. The Linux community is anyone who has cared enough to come and learn more, to come and spend time with other people, not because of, uh, well, who are, people who are here because they want to be here. And I hope that all of you want to be here, because otherwise, I won't mind if you leave. So the trick to being a member of the Linux community is actually very simple. You just have to care. You just have to turn up. And if we look at the number of people here and then think how 10 years ago Linux was a technology that many people had still never heard of, as a community, we have expanded massively. We have millions of members, and these people have achieved great things together. And really, Part of the question is, why would people not feel that they are part of the community? So what I'm actually going to focus on in this presentation is not so much what the Linux community is, but why we are very bad at getting people into it. And so obviously it's straightforward to say things like, well, Linux is difficult. Linux uh, is, uh, has a poor reputation as being a geeky technical thing and people just aren't interested. But at the same time, as a community, we have a whole range of problems that sometimes result in me being surprised that any of you are here at all. So apparently LCA is a family friendly conference and therefore I have uh, censored this somewhat. But as a community, we are very hostile in many cases. And if you look at a technical development mailing list, you will often see, or even not a development mailing list, if you look at project mailing lists, you will often see undisguised hostility aimed at people. Well, in many cases, it's, to be fair, it is rare that this hostility is unprovoked. Now, there are some people where this may be, uh, there are some people who are just very good at being hostile for no reason, but they're a minority. And however, we do have the problem that it's still often seen as um, funny or entertaining to be excessively aggressive towards people. We'll often pass around links to particularly well-written flames on email lists. And we are rewarding this kind of behavior, despite the fact that it's clear that naked hostility of this type is not a particularly good way of welcoming people. It's not a great way of making them want to carry on spending their time contributing to a project or using the software or filing bug reports. But we still value this, which is a little concerning. So 
so I'm certainly not going to claim that I am without any source of sin here. Uh, it's certainly not the case that this kind of hostility is the only problem that we have. Women in free software are clearly, currently, a very small minority, and there are many reasons for that. But part of it is probably that whenever there is somebody involved as a minority, uh, in this case, obviously, looking at female minority, people really notice that they are part of that minority. And the focus suddenly, instead of being what this person is contributing to the community, the focus is suddenly, wow, you're a girl, or anything else. And this is problematic. It, we do not, if we make people so aware that they're a minority, again, this is not something that makes people enthusiastic about participation. And again, I'm astonished that there are some people who carry on being involved with Linux despite having to deal with this kind of thing. Uh, again, in this case, we're kind of coming back to the hostile aspect. And it's not something where this naked hostility does occasionally we value is limited to the technical developers or the project mailing lists. We can, in many cases, see uh, well, in this specific case, this is a response by a journalist to an article that somebody put on, uh, placed on their own personal blog. We still do see it as acceptable to have this kind of hostility, and it's not limited to the developers. Uh, why do I have two copies of that slide? Well, yeah, okay. So anyway, you shouldn't do this kind of thing either. <laughs> so things that we do not, as a community, seem to have formed a particularly good consensus on uh, in terms of what is acceptable behavior. And obviously, oh. Open Office, I really hate you. Okay, so I have a slide that has bullet points and they're supposed to appear when I click. How do I do that when I'm in slide mode as opposed to having the presentation? Um, hang on a minute. God. Look, how about we just give up and we go and drink instead? <laughs> okay, that's better. Right, so... As I said, insults are perceived, uh, I'm not going to argue that insults are perceived as acceptable as such, but the level of these insults is often not something that we reproach people about. We do not point at people and say, well, that was inappropriate behavior. And sometimes the insults do turn into outright abuse. Um, we can see cases where somebody's, instead of just discussing somebody's opinions, we have cases where discussion turns into ad hominem attacks. We're not talking about why they were wrong to say that. We're talking about how that person is intrinsically wrong. But we can say that those things are inappropriate. We can say that, okay, while they do happen in the community, by and large, we agree that they are not appropriate behavior. But at the same time, we're not so clear as to why we're saying that. Now, if we say that insulting behavior and abuse is inappropriate, are we doing that because we um, feel that it's a moral issue, it's just morally wrong to attack people? Or are we doing that because of more pragmatic problems? Like if we abuse people, they might stop writing our code for us for free. And if we are starting to think in that way, if when we're saying that it is not acceptable for you to swear at another project member, 
we're doing so because we don't want to alienate that project member, then we are perhaps also, uh, I'm sorry, this is really not a piece of software I'm a fan of. Okay. <sighs> right. Once we're starting to think that way, are we then also at the start of a slippery slope where we do not want to allow any kind of behavior that might alienate potential community members? And I don't think we as a community have consensus on that point. We do not as yet feel that this behavior may put people off is a sufficient reason to change our behavior. And that's not always the case, but I think it is, we are at a point where as a community, we have to accept that we do have problems and that we can do something about that. And we can make the Linux community a more welcoming, acceptable place. So one example of this, uh, I think really one of the earlier points where, we, where people started thinking on these lines was when the Ubuntu distribution, uh, when the Ubuntu project was first being started, it was clear that they did not want to make some of the same mistakes that existed in the Debian community. And one of those things was the introduction of the Ubuntu Code of Conduct. And the Code of Conduct is, uh, it's not a particularly long document, but it effectively says, be excellent to each other. And this is a very straightforward, simple way of explaining how we should be behaving. Be excellent to each other is, of course, originally, uh, it's the basis of the philosophy espoused by uh, Bill S. Preston and Ted Theodore Logan, seen here. This presentation is not about Bill and Ted. <laughs> so we can look at Ubuntu and we can say, right, we have this code of conduct. And I think it is certainly the case that the Ubuntu Code of Conduct has been one of the reasons why the Ubuntu community has managed to exist in a form where users are considered members of the community in a way that hasn't so much been the case in other Linux distributions. But having a Code of Conduct in itself is nothing. A code of conduct is just words on a website, possibly also on a piece of paper. It's not very important where the words are. But if you're unwilling to actually engage in enforcement of that code of conduct, then it's useless. I would actually argue that in the case of Ubuntu, there are cases where People have been alienated and nothing has been done about this uh, because there was not agreement that the behavior that caused this was against the code of conduct or in some cases just because it's not seen as a sufficiently pressing issue. And, but in other cases, it's because people, well, this is a response. I, I was involved in the drafting of speaker guidelines for a project. And this was one of the pieces of feedback I got. Some people do not think that the idea of an actually enforced code of behavioral standards is a good thing, because they see it as a way of people being able to stifle debate. Instead of dealing with issues that people raise, you can just accuse them of violating your code of conduct, and you can shut them down. But in other cases, it's because there's a concern that it will turn a project from a fun place where people, which people are enthusiastic about spending their free time in, to one that is effectively just a corporate atmosphere. I think this is something of a false dichotomy. The idea that 
we should be nice to each other, for want of a better word, is not something that also says you cannot have fun. And while it is true that sometimes when you make a joke, you will offend somebody, or somebody will feel alienated, or you will encourage cultural perceptions, uh, cultural preconceptions that make it harder for somebody to be involved. That's okay. A code of conduct is, sorry, the idea of a code of conduct is not that behavior be ruthlessly stamped out and that anybody that violates it should be expelled from the project. The idea is, in general, that inappropriate behavior should be pointed out and people should have the opportunity to accept that this is inappropriate, apologize, and then move on. But instead, we see that, ironically, in many cases, the suggestion that a particular piece of behavior was inappropriate instead results in an argument about whether or not that behavior was inappropriate, which is kind of missing the point. If somebody says, I'm sorry, I felt marginalized because of something you've just said, then arguing over the precise definition of the word marginalized is not really likely to make that person feel better or more accepted in your community. So really, I think we need to realize this. I think it is right. one of the biggest problems we have is that, well, kind of changing the topic slightly. I'll come back to that. As a community, we have often valued code above all else. And that's obviously starting to change because we are seeing that people are willing to do things like translations. People are willing to write documentation. People are willing to sit on forums and provide support. And they'll do this and get nothing concrete back except for a feeling of having contributed. But really, when I say, oh, so when I say we value codes above all else, what I really mean is that we value direct contributions to the project above all else. And I don't think that this is a good thing. What we're doing there is neglecting the fact that getting people, to, for instance, to get people to use our software, we need people to talk about it. We need people to be using it and then mention it to their friends. We need those people to feel that by using our software, they are being a part of something. And this leaves us facing a choice. We can either have a community that is entirely based on technical excellence. Or we can start thinking about how we want a community that is made up of all the people who are here in this room and everyone else who wants to be part of it. So really, we're not doing that very well now. If you bring up the idea of codified behavior, you get pushback. If you bring up the suggestion that somebody did something inappropriate, instead it starts turning into an argument about that person as opposed to the behavior. We are possibly not, as a community, a terribly functional body, which is a shame because I think that everybody involved in this is, um, I like you people. Well, okay, some of you I don't. But But you're a minority, and I'm not going to tell you who you are, because that would be kind of rude. And we need to actually, at this point, we are now big enough that we need to start doing something about that. We need to start accepting that, as a community, we have not grown in the way that most normal communities do. We have people participating from all over the world. They come together, they spend time with us, and sometimes we're rude to them, and they go away again. 
we have not gained the kind of behavioral standards that we normally associate with the growth of a community. And part of that is because we are less, well, because we have thought of ourselves as a set of small communities that we can then kind of put a big circle around and say, well, this is the Linux community, it's all these small communities. And each of the small communities has their own standards, and then when we put them all together, we get sort of cultural impedance mismatches, and it all goes horribly, horribly wrong. But the fact that we can all be here, and for the most part avoid upsetting each other several times a year, implies that even if we haven't really thought about this, we, it basically works. We are capable of getting along. We are capable of making people feel welcome. We are capable of not punching each other in the face repeatedly. That's only happened to me once at LCA, and I deserved it. <laughs> so really, what I'm saying is that we should accept that when we say, when people say that we should discourage bad behavior, what we're saying is not we should be pushing people out of the community. We're not saying that we should prevent Linux being fun. We're saying that we should just accept that sometimes we upset people and we should never be enthusiastic about upsetting people or making people feel unwelcome. And obviously there is perhaps a cost to this. There are some people who are basically incapable of functioning in a community without upsetting other people. And obviously you can look at things like um, Ben Con Sussman's presentation, uh, Poisonous People and um, How to Deal with Them in Your Community. I can't remember the exact title. How to Deal with Poisonous People in Your Community. Even if people contribute great technical things to your community, sometimes in doing so, they are making your community appear to be a toxic place that is unwelcoming to new contributors or unwelcoming, um, uh, or unwelcoming to minorities. And we do need to make a choice. Are we, as a community, willing to say that some people are just so toxic to the perception of Linux as a whole that these are people that we do not want? And basically, that's the thought I want to leave you with. Uh, ends up getting through this slightly faster than I thought, but do we have any questions? Hi, um, I started in open source as a member of the KDE documentation team, so you can imagine this is a topic that's very near to my heart, also being an obviously female contributor. What do you do? I mean, what suggestions do you have about the elitism in the community that means that contributors who don't fit that specific mould are just not valued? The, you know, the awareness that it is a toxic thing to do to the community just isn't there because apparently if you know, people can't take the heat, then they should stay out of the kitchen kind of attitude. I mean, what can you do to fight that? Right, and um, that's, it's a good question. And if it has an easy answer, then we'd probably have fixed this some time ago. Really, part of it is that, part of the problem is that I think many people, as you said, don't realize there is a problem. And I think really the only thing we can do there is talk about it more. And people's willingness to speak out on issues, people's willingness to point at behavior and say this is unacceptable, I think that helps. I think if we have more people who will do that, then that raises perception of the issue. And with luck, people will just, through some amount of personal reflection, improve. But it's, not, it's certainly not the case that just by starting to think about discouraging bad behavior will magically turn into a place where suddenly it's all ponies and unicorns. Matthew? Uh, sorry. Uh, but yeah, we need people to talk about the issue. We need people to point at bad behavior, and we need it to be, ideally, people who are already respected within a community. I think this kind of thing carries much more weight if people who already have a good reputation within a project do it. Otherwise, 
it can just turn into a, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. We don't want that kind of thing. And, but if it is just seen as the people in a specific niche who are speaking out about it, then it's very easy to ignore that. Martin? Sorry for interrupting. Um, this may be a personal question. Feel free to ignore it. But what happened between 2004 and now, which made you <laughs> be the one to tell us how good we should be? <laughs> Uh, right, yeah, so clearly there is, well, right, there is firstly the assumption that I have got better and I'm not actually just some sort of horrific hypocrite. And to be fair, I am in many cases a horrific hypocrite, but I don't think this is one of them so much. Part of it is that I got older and that's... It was interesting. Um, as somebody who certainly at that period within Debian did have something of a reputation for being abusive, mostly towards technologies as opposed to people. But people liked that. Uh, people would speak to me because I did that kind of thing. It got attention. And partly what has probably changed is that I realized that I don't need to do that. That I can be a member of a community based on my contributions to the project in terms of the codes I write, the articles I write, uh, the people I talk to. So yeah, it was, I think really the strongest point was the realization that I could be respected without having to scream at people. <laughs> right. Right. That's bizarrely touching. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the Ubuntu Code of Conduct, which I think is a, a great resource for people setting up new communities or uh, establishing their own code of conduct where none exists so far and so forth. Uh, I've also read of a, a great uh, site called Five Geek Social Fallacies, uh, which is things like if I have two friends A and B, then they must also be friends. And if I can't, if they can't be friends, then I must dissociate myself from one of them. Uh, and this causes these kinds of stupid debates because someone says, well, no, it technically might not be abuse because I can't admit that my friend was wrong here. Um, but I, my general thought here is what resources, you know, what, what are good ways of finding uh, resources for these kinds of codes of conduct to, you know, that, that, and things that can teach us how to be you know, excellent in our communities? <laughs> uh, so that's an interesting question. I'm not really aware of anything particularly along those lines. Um, now, part of it is probably that so many of us were probably not particularly socially well-adjusted teenagers. And that this is the period where, in general, people learn how to get along in a more useful way. And so we're suddenly put in a collaborative group when we don't necessarily have a particularly strong track record or we don't have that much experience of working with others. And so if we do tie ourselves to somebody somehow, that does potentially mean that we're not going to be willing to accept that they're wrong. I think trying to actually teach people basic social decency is a pretty complicated task. Uh, I'm not sure that just pointing people to a website is really going to deal with that terribly well. Again, I think really um, the best resource here is, again, being having people who are good examples. And that's actually, when I mentioned earlier um, that speaking out about seat bad behavior was a good way of raising awareness. That does mean that we run the risk of it being perceived as people are just using this as a tool for attacking others. We should really be, as well as talking about bad behavior, we should be talking about good behavior. We should be pointing at examples of things that have gone well. We should be pointing at projects that, are well fun uh, that function well, that have a good body of contributors or, and users and where we don't have strong disagreements. And so resources for, I think the best kind of resource would be examples of things that work well. 
And it would be interesting to somewhere produce a wiki page just uh, with some pointers to projects that work well or specific disagreements that were resolved in a constructive manner even when they start off badly, that kind of thing. Uh, that would be an interesting project. All right. Um, so there's been a few different groups that have formed to kind of, I don't know, kind of protective groups, I guess I would say, for minorities. And I just wonder, um, how do you see that? Do you see those protective groups and, you know, I guess, obviously, I'm female and I've been invited to various um, female groups to try to combat some of the, the sexism, whatever. And, um, you know, how do you see that functioning inside of these communities? I think it, in an ideal universe, obviously, we wouldn't need these kind of groups. And I think it is certainly the case that is, there is a risk that these groups are perceived as being divisive. They're there to indicate that whichever body they represent is somehow separate to the rest of the community. But really, that's because the reason that we have this suboptimal situation is because, as a community, we have these issues. If there weren't a problem, we wouldn't need these. But to say that we shouldn't have them is equivalent to saying we shouldn't have problems. And that doesn't make them go away. So I think we do need that there is it's, part of the problem in being a minority, if you feel marginalized, is the feeling that perhaps it is just you. So if you do have other people that you can talk to about these issues, then they can firstly uh, reassure you that it is not your behavior, it is the behavior of other people. But also, it means that you can, as a group, come up with a more constructive and decisive way of improving things. So while I would love us to not need, say, lens chips, clearly they have a vital role at the moment in improving the community as a whole, not just for women, but for everybody. Um, it's very easy to, again, think of these behaviors as just driving out minorities. But there are many people who just don't get involved in Linux development or contributing because of the overall hostility of the community. Yeah, I agree. But also, I really like the idea of um, having the positive examples wiki. That would mm -hmm. be pretty badass. Hey, um, I think one thing we might want to do on occasion is also remind people that uh, whatever they're saying on mailing lists and IRC is public and logged, and it's pretty much going to be available forever. So yeah, they might um, not and occasionally just terror. reminding people that all their behavior is going to be visible in the future is obviously uh, something that can cause people to focus a little more on their own behavior. But then at the same time, I, that can help, but I don't think it's always sufficient. Some people are behave this way because they like behaving this way and they're proud of behaving this way. So the, well, what you're saying may be read by employers in the future. Well, that's fine. I wouldn't want them to hire me if they didn't agree with me behaving this way. So yeah, um, it does help, but it doesn't solve things entirely. And sometimes the problem is not that people are, even if, um, so, People may be proud of their behavior. Other times, people just don't think they're doing anything wrong. And even there may be many people who agree that they're not doing anything wrong. So again, that doesn't, the threat of future looking back at them isn't sufficient there. Yeah. Uh, one thing I haven't heard you mention yet is um, the role of, of cultures, because um, I don't think people often stop to think that we are a global community. And there are people who have been brought up in cultures where, for example, individualism and a certain degree of personal aggression is expected and other cultures where it's expected that you respect your elders or that you respect males for example um, and and there are no it's you know it's uncomfortable but it's true there are cultures people have been brought up in where there's an expectation on them if you're from Iran for example you know that you have to respect males and and um, you know all right that, that was that was a that was a very bad example, but um, right. <laughs> but the point I'm trying to make is that is that there are certain cultural expectations that people grow up with, and and you know yeah, it, and we so don't necessarily have is, a shared culture. Uh, really, 
we can get into an argument mm. about cultural relativism and so on, um, but really, pragmatically speaking, the Linux community is still is probably mostly perceived as being a broadly Western English speaking group. And uh, obviously, that's there are many people where this isn't true, but by and large, I think the cultural expectations we're heading towards are broadly the ones that match those. And yeah, well, obviously, that's a problem. If we exclude people who think this kind of behavior is acceptable, then we are perhaps excluding broad swathes of people who would otherwise be involved, which is kind of ironic. But we, at some point, we have to say that these are the expectations in our community. And if people want to be involved, then they need to meet those expectations. Uh, really, I, I wish I had a better answer there as well. Um, I do see the point you're trying to make. It's if people are coming from significantly different backgrounds, then we're not going to, then not going to immediately perhaps meet all of our social expectations. Uh, but then that's true in the general case. It's just more obvious for us because the internet is a lot cheaper than flying, except in Australia. I'm just going to mention something before the last, before I pass it on to Kristen. Um, I've been online since '93, and back then a lot of people who are online use handles rather than their own name. It is probably more different now with, with a lot of the um, social networking and all that where people use their own names. Now, I don't know about the development community, but is it? Um, would it have been normal for there to have been, say, females in your community that you didn't know about because oh, they were behind their own handles? And the fact that the development community was sort of mimicking the business world where women who succeed were women who were aggressive or who could, you know, could function like the males, executives. So in this, the women developers who could be on par in um, what, abusiveness? Right, As so part of, part of it is uh, certainly if you can avoid being, uh, avoid feeling attacked or marginalized by behavior that is, would otherwise be directed at you because of your gender, then see, some people are able to cope that way, and that does make it easier for them in a way. And this is probably the case that many of, say, the women involved in Linux are the ones who are, in terms of behavior, perhaps more masculine. Uh, I don't, but it's also the case that I don't think that that's the kind of thing that we want. Uh, it should not be the case that people need to hide who they are in order to be respected in our community. And I don't want to have to deal with the whole oh, on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog type situation. As somebody who's occasionally been known to promote an attitude of violence, I feel, um, <laughs> I feel upset and excluded by some of the things you've said. Right. <laughs> Do you think that every complaint is justified? Do I think that every complaint is justified? No. And clearly there are cases where, well, I think that your complaint there was unjustified, <laughs> for instance. Uh, yeah, it's obviously the case that sometimes, sometimes people do just get upset for no reason. Well, not, I'm not going to say no reason, for a not particularly good reason. And clearly the answer is not we should never say anything ever. Uh, sometimes people are just not able to function with others. Uh, really, well, that's a shame, but that is their problem rather than ours. On the other hand, that doesn't mean that the fact that somebody says that this behavior is inappropriate should, the default assumption should not be they have an invalid complaint. You should actually think about what they said, and then if thinking about it, you've said, well, I, I think my behavior is acceptable. I'm doing it for these reasons, and in future I may do the same again. And if people by and large agree with you, then okay, that's our community consensus on that behavior. It's fine. 
On the other hand, if you say that and everybody else says, well, actually, you're being a dick, then maybe the problem is with you. Julian? Yeah, so there's general communities where anyone's welcome and then there's communities where there is or perhaps should be some perhaps quite high barrier of entry. You could make the argument about Debian legal was the example that came up in my head, but other such communities where discussion may have... It is generally assumed that a useful comment in discussion may have quite a high historical cost of knowledge attached to it. And that's especially the case... When you start talking about getting pe new people involved, that's especially the case that's hard. Um, yeah, so obviously, for instance, uh, when I say we don't want to discourage people from being part of the community, uh, that doesn't mean that people should turn up and expect to be able to get their code straight into the Linux kernel. Uh, sometimes there are other things that will discourage people from being involved. But the point is not to make it possible for everybody to achieve everything. The point is that people should not be discouraged from participating when they could otherwise participate. Anyway, I think I'm out of time, so... Uh, should... Well, um, yeah, as, as being the open office guy here, um, I felt the love. Um, <laughs> uh, and it appears the pre presented screen extension needs a bit of um, hacking. If anybody's got a bug fix for that, please see Matt. <laughs> it won't currently let me quit. I've just escaped <laughs> and it's focusing windows. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, from a, a few few good drinks, and I, I can thoroughly recommend the wine. It won't be as bad as Britannia's screen. That's great. Thank Cheers. Thanks very much, Matt.